I think a true artist isn't going, okay, well, this is what people want, so I'm going to ahead and do this. The artist is going to create what he loves to create, what he sees in his mind, and is going to develop that no matter what. And then the people find you, and you connect with them. If you were a hunter, a bow hunter, and you didn't know how to make a bow and arrow, and you had to depend on somebody else to get a bow and arrow, you know, there's no way it would happen. I would make my own bow and arrow. I think my boards are a combination of all my favorite boards I've ever had. And I just kind of put it all into the board, I guess the board I want to ride. There's always a better board, so you're always looking for something better, something, you know, the next best thing. I feel like in my life I get, I feel empty inside if I'm not being like mentally or physically challenged. And like I could see that being a surfboard shaper was going to be like a never ending pursuit of that. The guys that have the fortitude to continue to develop and the courage to be their own, and the ones that, have, that are willing to work hard will come out ahead. The things that really have substance is design. You know, Al, Al Chapman, he's been super supportive, told me a good one, which I love. Um, and he said, don't overcharge your friends for boards. And I was like, that's so funny, man. He's such a legend. You know, he's got a million other pieces of advice, but I definitely was stoked on that one. Like, make your friends good boards and don't overcharge them. <laughs> Brother Kalada, uh, he was the primary influence in getting me in the ocean, getting me my first surfboards and stuff. We had a pretty talented uh, group of friends growing up. So the competitive state of mind was always there, whatever we were doing. Andy and Bruce, they pretty much were naturals from the beginning. They were good from the start. But um, guys like me, it took a lot more work to get there. Um, not there, but where, you know, at least where I felt like I was doing it right. Yeah, my mom had died in a flash flood when I was like 12 or 13. And that's when I quit surfing, get, started bodyboarding. When I was 16, asked Andy for a board, he gave me a board. I went to Wahoo and did the, what was it, the Hollywood, it was the Mabo back then. But I got second to Andy at the, in, the, in that contest and the waves were bombing, it was big and, you know, so between it being big and getting second to Andy, and it was pretty much the beginning of the, the second part of my surfing journey. kamale has been coming around because he's been um, picking up blanks from us. So I used to give him, we had like tons and tons of seconds that on the machine that something went wrong or whatever. And that kind of led me into these oddball shapes that, you know, I was forced to make these just different designs because the, the, the computer had cut these boards so bad in some weird way that I had to make some kind of, something kind of new or different, you know. I was forced to make some different shapes. It's hard, you know, when you're first learning. It's a lot of money, like a blank's like, what, 60, 70 bucks. So to go and practice on a blank and oops, you know what I mean? He gave me a bunch of advice and gave me the mother load of mental double bump, double pin wing squash templates. So much work to make all the templates and stuff. It's like, oh, you don't want to just throw it away, right? It's like, I just kept it for years and finally come and oh, what's all this stuff? Let me check them out. I said, yeah, you can take whatever you want. Just take whatever you want. <laughs> you know, that's not common, you know, that as far as shapers, old school shapers go, but you know, just like giving me these golden nuggets of info and and hardware. I give anybody advice, you know, whoever wants advice, you know. I want to see, you know, guys learn how to shape, you know. There's not too many guys starting to learn how to shape. The other thing about Glenn that I really like besides his big heart is uh, his uh, passion for shaping. It's still fire hot. He's really uh, done a good job as far as not only shaping, but keeping up with uh, the curve of the surfing uh, demand and, you know, all of that stuff. There's so many misconceptions about surfboards, and for me, 
and the way I make my boards or, you know, like to make majority of my boards. Um, I'm just into the old school, you know, single fins, um, twin fins, and low rocker boards, going fast, you know, floating good, and not having to like, want to throw your skegs out at the lip every every second, which I love doing that too, but the, you know, I don't know, it's like kind of, um, anything goes, yeah, and, and it doesn't matter if you look good, because, you know, some of the, the things that sur pro surfers are doing are amazing, but some of it just doesn't look cool at all, you know? Beside that, you know, I would rather watch Tom Curran than any day, so that's that. Get back to the, to the style of making boards for just a move or a wave. The opposite to that would be the surfboards that can do everything all right. Surfing still just pumps me up. People that get pumped up on surfing pump me up. Um, people that are passionate, not afraid to be wrong, it's like, it's all good, you know? I have a piece of paper that I wrote. It was like a what do you want to be when you grow up and I just put Charlie Smith because he was a firefighter and he surfed all the time and he shaped mental boards and I'm like yeah that's that's what I want to do. I mean I had a crack at the fire department too. I got in, I got all the way to the interview and they're like cool so you're pretty much in and I was just like well I'm here to basically tell you guys I'm out. I know it's gonna sound crazy but that's not what I want to do. I want to build surfboards, I want to make boards, I want to shape, I want to design. Why would you even want to build a board for yourself? Why would you even want to be in this industry or to come to a surfboard factory every day unless, unless you're connected with the ocean? And you're not just trying to build boards for other people, but you're trying to build boards for yourself. It starts with the passion first, right? We're, we're service first, shapers second. Literally, I was like spinning my wheels, figuring out like, you know what I mean, I did well in high school, but didn't really have this desire to go to college. I wanted to like challenge myself somehow mentally, you know. Yeah, I was getting my hair cut, and the lady cutting my hair said, yeah, I was just cutting Sue Arakawa's hair, and she mentioned that they need somebody to run their machine over there. You should contact them. When Eric picked up the phone, he was just like, who's this? Like, what's going on? No, we don't need anyone. Like, thanks for calling. I was just like, whoa, that was weird. And so I was like, I didn't take no for an answer. I just called him back like a couple weeks later and was just like, look, can you put my name on a list or something that like, if you need a guy, he's like, look, if you're that hungry, come in and we'll at least train you. And if somebody falls out, then you'll know how to run the machine. And that was it, they gave me a chance. I was in 2003 and I was just, I think about a year or two out of high school. And from there, as soon as I got in here, I just wasn't gonna let go.
at the time he was so busy, you know, with Andy winning world titles, HIC, the work was just, you know, stacked that we were actually running like a night shift too. And I always wanted the night shift so I could surf all day. And I'd be in here and no one would be in the factory. And so I'd just be like, <laughs> and I'd just go into the shaving room. I'd be like, oh. and I really wanted a single fin so bad. I just had this idea that I wanted to ride the single fin. I just was using their tools and using their broom and using his templates and just kind of winging it. And uh, that was kind of where I was at for probably about two, three years. And finally, I just got up the courage to be like, can I just show you something I've made that kind of worked, but I just can't seem to make it again, you know? I can't seem to replicate this. And uh, he was just like, oh, all right, you know, it's not bad, you know? And where'd you do this? I'm like, I did it in your room at night. And he was just like, well, really? And so, yeah, they all kind of just like said, like start scrubbing them out, start doing it, start looking at curves, start really, really wanting it, you know? And you can, you can do it. And uh, if I probably would have been told that you got to ride such junk boards for so long, it might have been a little discouraging, but yeah, in, in the end, it, it, yeah, it, it's been a passion of mine for sure. Uh, one thing I noticed is that um, he had an eye for detail, and it's not just having an eye for detail, but you have to be able to see things. Uh, before they even exist. And so you have to look conceive of design aspects and all that. And so those early years of him seeing it's a bunch of different shapes from a bunch of different shapers uh, helped. So through all the years, I've, I've trained a bunch of different shapers and some see it and some don't. And, and, and he knows it right off. Said, look, if you want to learn from me, this is the way I'm building boards, and really, this is the way I see the future of boards going. So, if, if you want to, you've got to develop these skills. And I was went and took night classes to learn how to use Illustrator because it was the same kind of vector, same kind of an idea. And he was like, Look, you're gonna be, you got to be a designer these days, and that's what you want to shoot to do. And so, that was yeah, that's what I started following the line doing. Just the way that he was meticulously approaching boards and just really like everything was just really documented and everything was really precise. I just loved his approach and it was it reminded me of maybe the way my dad built things so that it was like this really kind of like a nurturing but Eric's was almost like too black belt in the beginning for any sort of like mentorship where like I needed somebody like a galley who was willing to like kind of coach me through it and let me just kind of like stumble along and kind of make some mistakes where it's like Eric everything's just really perfection and then I think when it got to a point where you could really see that I wanted to know the nitty gritties and I really wanted to get into it and that he was really investing the time and kind of like bringing me through. Our connection between me and Eric probably has gelled in probably like the past five years and like that's been like, like I said, it got to a point where I'm asking the questions that he did. Now he can answer me. I'm going, I, I want this. Or like, he's seeing such fine points and curves and breaks and just subtleties that it takes a while to kind of get there to actually acknowledge him. And then when you do, he's just going, like, okay, now we're together. I mean, we connect on a lot of different levels. So it's, it's really easy for me to just, I don't even have to tell him why to do things because he already gets it. And so in that sense, it's, more than a job for sure, and I think that's what you gotta search for, I think, as a shaper, because it's not like the most financially friendly job that you could find, but it definitely brings these like, this sensei and understudy kind of an idea, and for me, I love that feeling. I feel like that's the only way I could describe it, is I got just lucky. At the right time, I swooped in here. At the right time, I had good mentors. My wife, we've been together for so long, and her dad's a shaper, so she kind of knows the income and the lifestyle and what it comes with. So I think I was just blessed to not have anybody just kind of like telling me I'm blowing it and telling me I'm blowing it as I was, you know, kind of getting the ball rolling. And I was lucky to be surrounded by people that were kind of encouraging me to keep up with it. My mom and my dad surfed, and uh, I had an older brother and sister who surfed, so going to the beach was pretty regular for us. And I got surfed with my dad, I remember surfing on the same board with him. I don't know, I remember like just being on a boogie board, sand sliding, um, as far as my memory goes back. 
I think my very first board my dad shaped. And then my first custom board though was a Chuck Andres. I think I was eight. And then I had a couple hand-me-downs in between that time. Every board when you're little is like the best board you ever had. Yeah, they were all magic back then. <laughs> You develop your design, you develop your aesthetics through the type of boards that you like to surf, the ways you like to surf, and I think that's that's the essence of your own personal uh, design genre. That's how it develops, and uh, and, you, and you see it. Yeah, I watched uh, Searching for Tom Curran, Curran on the fish at Bawa. Uh, definitely the exposure that Mikala brought, like riding for Rip Curl. He brought back like boards from Derek Hine. And I was riding this 5-6 fish channel bottom, like glass on fins. And I was like, why is this like grown man's board turn better than my little kid board? That was a light bulb moment. And so I wanted that board because no one's really making those boards anymore at that time. So my dad and I made it. Brian and my dad made it, but we made that board together when I was like 10 or 11. And then after that, I was like, oh, okay, this thing's sick. And then I tried to make a couple short boards, like three or four short boards. And I to tell, like, okay, yeah, this board doesn't work as good as my Ben Ipa's, so I want to get better at surfing, so I need to ride a better board. So put shaping um, on the side for a while. Kind of doing that whole time though, I was always interested in surfboards and surfboard designs. Um, I still did like a fish like every other year until maybe I was about my mid 20s, almost like 10 years ago. I think Glenn Payne gave us a bunch of uh, miscuts and Mikhail and I were reshaping them. I'm pretty stoked to see like Daniel taking it up. He has access to some of the best surfers trying his boards too because Mikhail rides his boards or he knows like a bunch of all the good guys that surf, you know, so he'll give, give like some guys with some boards is like, oh, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And they're lucky because they get feedback right away, you know, from like not only himself, but like guys that they know. And then I kind of like got into it a lot more. I started hand shaping and started to ride all my own boards at that point. I probably got less boards once I started shaping because it's a lot of work and I'll always put someone else's board in front of mine. It's a lot easier just to pick up the phone and call someone and have them make you a board. <laughs> After hand shaping for a while, I can see why people would use the computer. Hand shaping is so much work, so I have so much respect for all the guys who made a living before the CNC machine was available. Back then, everything was handmade. There was no such thing as computers, so yeah, everything. And the blanks were so fat and thick, you needed to take like so many passes off the board. You pretty much had to create the whole board yourself because the blanks were so crude. You had to develop the hand skills. You had to, you had to develop um, the, the skill with the tools. You had to develop your eye directly with the foam. You had to be able to read the foam. You had to be able to see the imperfections. You had to get the board's level. You actually, you're, you're seeing things in your mind. You're trying to make sure that you're, you were subtracting the foam just enough to match that, that mental picture. When I'm shaping a board, I'll change it so many times, it'll, it'll change as I'm shaping it, or you'll see things that I haven't seen before, and I'm like, well, that might work there. Like, I'd like to try that and just put it in there. And so if I was working on a machine, I would have missed all of those opportunities. Originally, I wanted to get to, like, I think at first I said a thousand hand shapes, but then it went down to 500, and that number is dwindling, it seems like. Because <laughs> if I'm in here, I'm not surfing. I love to travel and see different things and surf different waves. I think I want to like, eventually like, be more of a traveling shaper. That way I can keep traveling, keep surfing, and just go different places and work. 
So if I ever get the opportunity to go and shave in other countries, I would be uh, thrilled to do that. Shortboards have started to get a little shorter and wider, but for a while, the little potato chip shortboards maybe have that place. But for most people, unless you're trying to do blow gels on every turn, they're kind of worthless, I think, for most of the first. I think my outlines, I do a lot of fishes and little shorter, wider type things, and so they kind of have like a 80s look to them. A little bit rounder outlines, but still lower rails, um, yeah, controllable, sinkable rails. So I guess I'm just having fun making boards, writing them, and starting to catalog my models, and then I can release my whole line when it's all ready. But I just want to enjoy it and learn and I just want to make a, a good product and I don't want to be like too busy where I can't travel and I can't surf. So it's just trying to balance everything. There is an indescribable satisfaction when you paddle a powder board that you built yourself, you designed and built and you catch that first wave and just go, this board is doing what it's supposed to be doing, you know? And um, it doesn't always happen, but I tell you what, it, it's so satisfying when it does all come together.